Hello and welcome to BharatShakti.in. I'm Brigitte Chatterjee. We're going to be talking about the Gaza war today. Not as much as about how it started, but more about how has it progressed. And even more about how is it that the powers that be have been able to constrain it, keep it at the level that it is there today rather than becoming a regional war. Uh, to go through the spaces, I have with me Lieutenant General Raj Shukla. Lieutenant General Raj Shukla is a gunner officer. I must emphasize on the gunner part of it because I am a gunner myself. Uh, he's been the army this, commander. And this is the age of firepower. <laughs> <laughs> this is the age of firepower like he says and I totally agree with him. Well, he's been the army commander uh, in Shimla, the training command. He's also a member of the UPSC at the moment. Thank you so much for having joined us. Thank you, sir, for calling me and thank you to Bharat Shakti too. It's a great pleasure. Okay. The, let me go to the first issue. And the first issue is primarily about uh, the first April attack by the Israelis that I'm talking about. See, why did it have to be Damascus? Why did it have to be Syria? Why did it have to be a third country? And uh, what is the kind of weapons, equipment, etc. that were used to uh, kill those 12 or 13 people uh, there, all Iranians? Uh, if you can give us some let's say, in-depth uh, sight into that particular issue. So let me put it this way, sir, that these escalatory spirals between Iran and Israel, they have turned a decades-old proxy war into red-hot conflict. This has to be understood into in terms of the broader geopolitics. So just allow me two minutes on the geopolitics and then we'll get sure, sure. the combat mechanics. And finally, if we have time, uh, I'll suggest a few lessons for India. If okay. we have time. Sure. So one is the geopolitics. If you look at the current balance of power, how the US rides on it, in my view, is with two instruments. One is these 800 bases, $950 billion, 11 aircraft carriers, which it spends, which primary purpose, whose primary purpose, purpose is freedom to roam the globe. Dunya bhar mein ghoomne ki azadi. It's very material. See, 71, sir, 7th fleet here. Uh, 1995, China acts funny over Taiwan. Clinton sets two aircraft carriers. The message goes, China retreats. So the use of military coercion to influence strategic choices. And the second tenet on which the US rides is uh, making sure that there no regional hegemon emerges in any theater. So a NATO to contain the Russians, preventing a Chinese breakout from the first island chain, through a network of allies, Japan, South Korea, uh, Philippines, and in West Asia, now I'm coming to that, they made sure by creating a technologically ascendant and military powerful Israel, they kept a very large and powerful neighbor like Iran in check. And we, there were a series of measures all these years, you know, killing of assassination of scientists like Mohin Fakhrizadeh, Stuxnet, Viper, occasional intervention by the American naval fleets. But into this vortex, and this is the point I wish to make, stepped in the genius of Qasim Soleimani. This is the time to recall his genius. And, you know, in my view, he stepped into this game with the brilliance of a met meteor and, and the impact of a whirlwind, which is now being seen. He first creates this axis of resistance. You just see this when the aircraft carriers used to go anywhere, everybody would retreat. So what did Suleimani do? He created this octopus with five tentacles. Syria, Iraq, Gaza, Lebanon, and Houthis. And these tentacles were the challenge he posed in terms of asymmetric power to the Americans. So that, that is what is called the axis of resistance. And the crown jewel of this is the Hezbollah, which is still not being used. It is the Brahmastra. So these land instruments were directly challenging American now, what he did next, sir, that he lays this axis, which is basically political connections and influence pathways with military prowess. So this axis of resistance became the ring of fire. And this ring of fire is, I don't know whether there's a direct connection, but what Hamas did. Hamas, whatever it did now on 7th October, was a military-grade invasion, which took Israel by great surprise. And the IDF's response, very modestly to say, was pathetic. It had been militarily challenged. And now we come to these spirals. So Israel had to respond. From December to March, they killed 12 IRGC commanders, IRGC and Quds Force commanders. And on that fateful day on 1st April, and before that Hamas, 
this is no longer that mighty IDF. It's still powerful, but six months down the line, Hamas is defeated but not depleted. Six battalions of the Hamas still remain in four in Rafah and two in the central areas. The hostages have still not been returned. So look at the pressure on the Israelis. And then on the 1st April, they get this information that uh, the uh, Brigadier Mohammad Raza Zahidi, now he's almost Suleimani's equivalent, as important as him, as powerful as him, he's the boss of the Levant. All the military coordination in these areas is being done by him. Now they get the information that he's there. They know this is Iranian soil, a consulate, which they cannot strike. But if they don't strike him there and they lose him, there will be consequences. So in my view, they take the gamble on the first tree and they do an <coughs> airstrike. But one thing that has changed and that answers your question. Whenever in any regional competition, the stakeholders change the rules of the game, it's a dangerous moment. Israel changed the rules of the game. They struck Iranian soil and they lost all support. I mean, the Americans were telling them perhaps that what they did was not right. And so that is the significance of 1st April. Mohammad Raza Zahidi, a big catch, almost the equivalent of Soleimani, somebody the Israelis cannot resist, but they changed the rules of the game. And that strike is successful, which says what? Now, Iran is forced to respond. And then now we can come to the attack on 14th April. But the yeah. geopolitics is important. Now, they have given the Iranians uh, an opening to prove that they are equal to the Israelis. And if, I, if you see what has happened today, what matters in deterrence is control of escalation dominance. In my view, escalation dominance has shifted from the Israelis to the Iranians. And that is what is most significant about uh, um, the, the current crisis. No, let me then ask you to amplify a little more on yeah. the Iranian response yeah. of okay. the Israelis. Really. Yes. And uh, the fact of it is that you had so many systems going down to, yeah. the, to the Israeli objectives. And there seems to be... Uh, no damage done, really. Yes. What's while no, what's while damage done. So what is this? Is this just a game being played out uh, at the top? Uh, or is this uh, some other kind of a strategy? What is it? So absolutely, sir. I mean, that's a um, very nice, uh, I mean, a nice question. So let's do a objective strategic military analysis of it. So Israel first changes the rules of the game. Now, Iran also responds by changing the rules of the game. Thus far, I mean, Israel had been struck many times in 2018 from Syria, but from the proxies, from the tentacles. This is the time the brain of the octopus itself unleashes that attack. And I, you know, I've read it somewhere, but I, I mean, this is how I would put it. It was an enormous barrage. 325 missiles is not small. Just imagine 325 Chinese missiles coming to Definitely, us. Definitely, that so is it's the a, issue. But that you stop all of them. With this yes, yeah, that is it. But it was always also a salvo, salvo of restraint which points to great diplomatic sophistry of the Iranians. I'll tell you how in my view. So first what they do is that they give prior warning. It's now common knowledge that CIA boss uh, William Burns was informed about it 72 hours in advance, perhaps through some interlocutors in Oman. So the Americans know. They know these missiles are coming. Then is the staggered, staggered synchrony. If all these 325 had come on Israel at one time, which was very much possible operationally, I, I presume the AD would have been overwhelmed. But what they do, first they warn burns. So you put your radars on, you make sure your missile defenses are ready, geospatial int is uh, done. And then they televise the launch of the drones on Iranian television. So the air defenses are pre-warned. And though you have 185 drones, about 100 ballistic missiles, some 35 crews and some hypersonics which have gone through. The hypersonics is also critical. Iran has hypersonics, Israel, hyper, uh, USA hypersonics are still in the prototype stage. I'm told that the damage to both uh, the bases, Nejev and Nevatim, have been done by the hypersonics, which is dangerous. And what happens in this is that when these this barrage is fired, Firstly, in the resistance or in the interception, 50% of it is done by extraterritorial forces, which is US Navy, US Air Force, UK Navy, Iran, Jordan. So it's not just a solely Israeli response. So 50% is done by them and some missiles get through. Severe damage has been caused in Nejiv and Nevatim both. 
some damage also in the command and control station in Tel Aviv as also the end station in the Golden Heights. So all the instruments that were involved on 1st April have been hit back. Now there are some problems on the Iranian side too. I am told 50% of the ballistic missiles didn't go through so on and so forth. But the issue is that the message has gone from his Iran to Israel that listen next time you cross the red line we will hit you in the mainland and if we do not do this staggered synchrony and if we do not warn some 100-150 missiles can go through. This is the first time that Iran or Israel's mainland is vulnerable to the Iranians. So in my view it is a big change that they are saying that this time we have not really followed it through, next time we could. Look, I will give you a very simple yes. explanation, simplistic one and that is uh, are we reaching a point where there is a different kind of strategy which is being employed by both the opponents, by both the opponents. Uh, each opponent try to help his other partner in trying to meet the uh, requirements of his domestic population. And so you say that uh, fine Israel has uh, attacked us, we have attacked back and actually do no damage and Israel says okay fine I attack, oh, I have sent in one missile and uh, it is to a very uh, sensitive spot and that is where the uh, exchanges stop. Is this some kind of uh, helping each other kind of a, a strategy? One is that but I would not say it is thoroughly gamed. In my view it is what? The relationship between the middle powers and the world's only superpower is being redefined. You see Biden every time he says don't, every time Blinken says don't, Austin says don't, Israel goes ahead, Iran does not listen. So the relationship of the middle powers with the superpowers is changing greatly. Houthis sir have blocked Red Sea what for 4 to 5 months now, it would have been an impossibility in the past. The Iranians are threatening to block the Strait of Hormuz. So if you see the larger geopolitics, Russia is not listening to the Americans in US in, in Europe. Iran is now challenging USA through Israel. How will the Americans focus on Taiwan? When they have to focus on Taiwan, they are distracted by these three theatres. And therefore, uh, also one point sir, we must not look at, this is important, what saved Israel? So their own Iron Dome their arrows 2 and 3, David Sling, Advanced Patriot, Ages, A and TPY2. It is a very sophisticated air defense which may not always be available to the Israelis. So next time, just hypothetically, if the Americans are not in, how vulnerable are the Israelis? In that sense, the game has got stepped up. Iran was always on the back foot. And here the larger game now is what? This is what was reported, which is in, in the realm of speculation, but very informed speculation by people like Pepe Escobar. They say, and now this is not, not speculation, but some, some uh, truth in it. They say that Israel F-35 went up with nuclear weapons. It was planning an EMP detonation over Iran. It was serious. It was taken down by somebody. Now, if there is any truth in that, look at the level of escalation. And these are Pepo Escobar, Larry Johnson, not just normal YouTubers. They are people who deposed before the US Congress and all in very good names. So there was a larger escalation on perhaps Plan. planned, <clears throat> maybe interrupted. So the spiral was pretty dangerous. And now you have Iran and Israel in a direct face off. And if is Iran is two screwdrivers away from nuclear capability, which means what? Uh, fissile material two months but and a proper bomb one year down the line. Look how the equation will change. It is going to change global geopolitics. The world is worried about Taiwan. Incidentally, sir, two weeks before October 7, Jake Sullivan in a press conference said, you know, we have problems all over, but Middle East is taken care of. Look at this. So the Middle East is exploding in a huge way. There is a lot to worry about there. Okay, uh, partly uh, already uh, you have uh, addressed the issue. The next issue that I wanted to yeah. focus a little more on is we have been able to keep it constrained, whether it is the Americans who forced the F-35 out or F-35 out of the sky or forced it to land, whatever be it. So what have these elements done really, whether it be Americans, whether it be UK, whether it be France or whether it be Saudi Arabia, how have they been able to maintain uh, ensure that the area of conflict does not enlarge to a regional war. So the Americans by geospatial <coughs> int 
by Saudis by keeping their airspace open, UK by these fighter jets coming in from Cyprus. And many of these mis drones have been intercepted by 20 mm bullets. So it is from 20 mm bullets all the way to the sophisticated missiles. But one thing is sure, sir, if Israel didn't have the support of the Western powers, 60, 70 missiles would have gone through. And if 60, 70 of had gone through and caused greater havoc, Israel would have been forced to respond in a far bigger way. So, I mean, if we have to give any credit to the Americans, it is in making sure that while Iran responded... I, I have more of the belief that yes, uh, perhaps those 60 to 70 that would have really gone through to their objectives that you're talking about, their objectives were not hard objectives. They were, the whole thing was organized perhaps in such a way... That. So, they kept clear of population centers, yeah, but the keep... military bases they took on were… Selective bases. But important ones. Important ones, important yes. Ones. But there is no damage to life over there. Yes, there was no damage to life. Right. So, yes. so, there was some, as I say, salvo of restraint, some stage management. Huh. But the sig it is more, a less debt punitive strike, more deterrent signaling. Less punitive strike, more deterrence. More de yeah, it's more in the area of deterrence to each other and more somehow or other you but, help each other but out of... Uh, there's, there's one point, one more point. So, look at the power of asymmetry. Now, this whole Iranian response was in millions of dollars. The Western response was, I'm told, 1.752 yeah, billion. Definitely. And see, sir, asymmetry. what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. Each time three drones are fired, $20,000. You send six missiles to intercept, $12 billion. One drone gets through and hits a $30 billion US ship with 300 sailors. Look at the power of asymmetry and that's why the Americans are keeping off. In Taiwan, the admirals have told Biden that don't ask us to come in. Aircraft carriers will be sunk. This, see from 1995 to now. So the larger point I made at the beginning, sir, the American hegemony is being challenged by Houthis, by the Iranians, Israel doesn't, Biden keeps saying don't. And they do precisely the opposite. So the declining power of don't. This is the whole, whole Americans should be seriously worried that their deterrence is failing. I'd quote Neil Ferguson, sir. He says, America, this is an opera of failing deterrence. Act 1, Afghanistan. Act 2, Ukraine. <laughs> Act 3, West Asia. See what's going to happen in Taiwan. So I think it is pretty significant from that sense. Point All right. Let's transit from war to peace. And there are lots of peace proposals floating around. I think even now, but of Jack Sullivan's statement, he said that the Israeli proposal is, uh, he was going all gaga about the Israeli uh, proposal, that it's been uh, extremely, uh, I would say, sensitive a proposal that Israel has put across. Otherwise, the other proposals are also being discussed in Riyadh, perhaps. What is the status as far as peace proposals are concerned? So, I'm a more a specialist in war than in peace, so I really <laughs> won't have this, but yes. So, the main point is this, and I think this is where these Israelis had a right to defend themselves. But perhaps in the military leveraging, they have not exercised what is called calibrated restraint. This business of civilian casualties, they have gone overboard. And I think in that sense, they have lost the narrative. And so this business of going into Rafah is critical. I get the Israeli viewpoint that unless you take out the Hamas, the Hamas has to be eradicated. But it has to be done with greater patience. It cannot. The choice is three weeks and 20,000 lives lost or six months and 5,000 lives lost. What the Indian Army has done in Kashmir is the latter. Restraint, calibrated restraint in the long term, greater payoff. So I'm saying that the Hamas has to be finished off, but with some restraint. This blunt use of the military instrument has armed Israelis greatly. Now, as far as the peace proposals are concerned, sir, what I have seen, you would also have seen, it is about whether they should go into Rafah, how should aid come in. Now, the problem there is what, sir? Egypt is not willing to take these people. Jordan is not willing to take these refugees. Where do the poor, poor refugees go? So, Two-state solution seems to be too idealistic, but some kind of settlement with the Palestinians, resettling them has to be done. It can't just be the military instrument alone. And there the intervention by UAE, by the Saudi Arabians will be useful. But we've seen this going on for now months. They don't seem to be reaching. A, and the ICJ also, I believe, has pronounced strictures on uh, the Prime Minister Netanyahu. So... Diplomacy is getting difficult. If and as diplomacy gets difficult, the instrument of force steps in, and that's why it's escalating constantly. All right. One last question, and that's about the lessons for us in India. So, lessons in India, sir. Before that, I just want to herald one point. Look at, sir, the arrival of the Crick. Now, this we must not deny any longer. China, Russia, Iran, North Korea. 
The Russians are back in the game in Ukraine only because of North Korean ammunition. Look at what Blinken was in China and he's made this o open uh, statements about Chinese supplying engines for drones, optical equipment, jammers, parts for jets. Uh, they are buying 40% of their oil, nitrocellulose for ammunition. So, the milit Russian military resurgence has been dependent on both China and North Korea. North Korea gave them 1.5, uh, 2.5 million artillery rounds. I read an assessment where they are saying that the aggregate military arsenals of Crick are four times better, quicker and smarter than the West. Advekta, sir, one, two days before the battle was lost, an audit was carried out of two infantry brigades of the Ukrainians. One had 15 artillery rounds, one five. The other had 40 mortar rounds. And this is the combined How might. How will they fight? How will they fight? And this is the point we have to take that this crick, China, Russia, Iran, Korea, call it whatever alliance, axis, it is posing a severe challenge to Western deterrence. Now, the lessons for India, sir, I see are this. That we are luckily enjoying a peace dividend. When all this tamasha is going around the world, we have this is time for us to step up our game. And here I see three areas: sir. territorial combat, strategic deterrence, and power projection. Territorial combat, we are still all right. It is in strategic deterrence and power projection we need to step up our game. Sir, if it is 15 and 40 there, those rounds, we need to carry out a stockpile audit, take a review our inventories and carry out a readiness review for high intensity combat. This is all high intensity combat. It is very different from the day to day skirmishes on the LAC. In my view, we need a drone missile complex yesterday, if not today. There is no option to it. Look at the AD networks. I, from Iron Dome to Arrows to Patriots, everything. Let's honestly, do we have such a sophisticated response? We really, or we will be in for severe vulnerability. A transition to AI. AI will be the secret sauce against China. And I, I can detail it subsequently. Uh, our defense spends, I'd like to just make this point. China's defense budget has grown by 7.2% this year when it is spending, when its economy is growing by just 3 to 4%. We have the luxury of our economy growing at 7%. We are spending only 2%. So, Deterrence, it is wiser to spend on deterrence. Deterrence is costly, but wars are costlier. If you don't spend now and we are in that 1540 position tomorrow, in the it, is, it doesn't make sense. So the last two points. The Russian Air Force, you would notice, was absent for the last two years. It took them two years to make much of their dumb munitions precise, and they were back in a big time, telling effect. We have to have a, a huge precisionary project. Artillery, air, that is what is changing the game. And also this air power audit that I spoke of. So these seven, eight points, I mean, if we seriously work on them, it will going to take us 20, 25 years. And also a turn to the seas, that, that that point has come. So these are all the lessons from, if we don't seriously build our Navy, so look at the Houthis, they are challenging the <laughs> Americans. So we really need to step up our game on all these fronts. Right, I think we'll finish on Thank that you so much. Note. Thank you so much, thank you. Jal. Thank you for having with the Bharat Shakti. Thank Dottin. you, sir. Great pleasure. Thank you. And thank you, viewers. Thanks for tuning into Bharat Shakti Dotted. Do tune in like this now and then, and you will find interesting stories. Thank you.